The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. Welcome to the Center for Healthy Aging's um, public lecture series. Uh, for those of you I haven't had a chance to personally meet, my name is Julie Avanzino. I'm a program representative for the Center for Healthy Aging. And the Center for Healthy Aging focuses on health and well-being through innovative research, um, training, and also community outreach. This event is one of our many public outreach purposes that we do, and our work, including this public lecture series, is supported entirely through donations. I want to take a moment here and thank each of you who have supported us throughout the years. Our work wouldn't have been possible without you. We look forward to advancing this exciting work together with you, and with more inf for more information about our center and for how to donate, please visit aging.ucsd.edu. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Heather Hofflick. Heather is a professor of medicine at UC San Diego. She provides endocrinology and primary care for adults. She has a special interest in osteoporosis, thyroid and women's health issues. Dr. Hofflick is consistently named top doc in San Diego Magazine's Physicians of Exceptional Excellence. Dr. Hofflick completed her fellowship training at UC Irvine College of Medicine and her residency training at Beth Israel Medical Center. She completed her internship at University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Dr. Hofflick earned her medical degree at Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and her undergraduate degree at Cornell University. She is board certified in internal medicine and endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Heather Hofflick. What I'm going to do today is a little different than I've done in prior years because I think we have a lot of new information and I want to make sure that everyone absorbs it well. I'm going to talk mostly today about, um, we'll start and describe osteoporosis to you. I'll talk about how we diagnose it, secondary causes of osteoporosis, FRACs, and we're going to talk prevention. I will talk briefly about the treatments, but I think that that is now a talk in itself, so I hope to come back and return very soon for osteoporosis part two. So let's get started and talk about the definition of osteoporosis. So it's a skeletal disorder characterized by compromised bone strength predisposing to an increased risk of fracture. And bone strength really integrates two features, bone density, which is something we obviously can measure with a bone density scan, but there's also something we have to take into consideration, and that's our, the quality of bone. And that's what we're doing more and more. So you can see here, a lot of people get confused when they come to my clinic what's osteoporosis versus osteoarthritis? So osteoporosis, as you can see here, this is a normal bone matrix in the spine in a vertebrae. But here is osteoporosis. There's decreased bone density, reduced networks, increased porosity. Whereas with osteoarthritis, when people ask me, this is a normal spine, it's actually just occurring more in the, inter, in the disc space and in joint spaces in the hip. So it's really a narrow disc, but it's not loss of bone density. Um, so that is the big difference for you to know. And the main way that we evaluate is through a bone density test, but there's also other characteristics of bone that we can measure, and that is the bone remodeling, architecture, and damage accumulation, and we are getting better in that as well. So all these together, the bone mineral density plus bone quality equals the strength of our bones. So I always bring this up. I think osteoporosis is an important topic. This is a slightly older slide, but it's really important to know that we 
there's really a high incidence of osteoporosis compared to other disease states that are very common. And so you can see here, the rate of osteoporotic fractures is much higher. And why is this important? Well, fractures are associated with an increased morbidity and mortality, meaning an increased risk of infection, death, problems associated with a fracture. So it's very important that we identify and treat people at risk. And so it's common. About one in three women over 50 will experience an osteoporotic fracture in their lifetime, as well as one in five men. And this is really important that we look at this population and figure out how we can identify this. Another important thing that we're learning is that a first fracture over the age of 50 is really important. A wrist fracture is an indication that perhaps, as you can see here, over the next five to 10 years, your rate of fracture, your risk for having another fracture is very high. So it's important that when you have a fracture, you talk to your primary care doctor and you alert them that you had a fracture. And hopefully you will get a bone density and get care from that because it's important that we identify people as risk. So the first fracture is very important and should be and is an event where we can help diagnose and treat. So why are we worried about fractures? Well, look at the compression fracture of the spine. There's many different types. You might hear of these wedge and crush fractures, but really what's happening is this is when height loss occurs and pain. Fractures are a downward spiral. They're associated with pain, height loss, problems. So we want to prevent these in everyone, and that's why we're doing bone density scans and assessing risk. The other big thing which can be a problem is a hip fracture. And as we know, hip fractures increase the risk for problems, infections, and even death. So these are there are many different types of hip fractures diagnosed on the area where it occurs, but it's very important that we prevent spine, hip, and all types of fractures. So how do we diagnose it? What should you do? Well, most people hopefully have seen this machine in this room. This is a bone density machine. And basically, the bone density, we assess the hip and the spine, or the two main areas. And what it's measuring is bone mineral content over area, as we said before. Um, and then there's the criteria. Many of you probably have heard of these T-scores that your doctor uses to describe how bad are your bones, or what state are your bones in, or how good. So normal is minus one and above a T-score. So what is a T-score? It actually compares your bone mineral density with the mean value for young adults and expresses this in a standard deviation. It is a tool to help your physician understand where your bone density lies. So there is something called low bone mass, which we used to call osteopenia. And actually at UCSD, we're getting very good now at not using the term osteopenia um, and really referring this to low bone mass. And this is if you have a T-score of minus 1 to minus 2.5. The diagnosis of osteoporosis is if your T-score is less than minus 2.5. So that means minus 2.5, minus 2.8, minus 3, anything lower, that is diagnostic of osteoporosis. Now, if you have what's called a fragility fracture, that is a fall that, that from a standing height or something that really shouldn't cause a fracture. For instance, you twist and you have a fracture, you cough and you have a fracture, or they pick up a fracture on your x-ray, that's a fragility fracture. That equals osteoporosis automatically even if your bone density falls in the normal range. That is an osteoporotic fracture, and um, it is important that we identify and treat that. There is something on the bone density scan that we use in patients less than age 50. That's called a Z-score. When you're less than age 50, we compare you to someone of your own age, and that is termed a Z-score. Um, but typically, we use this T-score to kind of put you in range and classify you. And I'll explain more. So this is the picture that I look at every day when I'm looking at my patient's bone density scan. I always look at the picture, the spine and the hips, and it helps me. I look at all these numbers and pictures, but I, I am certified and I know how to read these and to see what your values are. So this is something that when you have a bone density, this is the printout that your physician receives. Now, I just want to alert you and make you more knowledgeable in this area. Sometimes patients come in and they say, wow, my hips are low and I have osteoporosis, but my spine is really good and normal. But, and then sometimes people with normal spine are fracturing. 
And the important point is your physician really does need to look at the picture of the spine bone density. Sometimes, as you can see here, there's a lot of white in this area. And when you have arthritis, as we discussed before, which is a very common part of aging, it actually falsely elevates that T-score on your bone density. And so it's not accurate in many patients. So it's very important that these pictures are looked at. So what I do when I see that is I know then I can't trust as much as I trust the hip bone density, but I can still get an estimate. But there's other values. Sometimes you might be asked to do a, a distal radius, a wrist DEXA, if your spine cannot be evaluated. So there's other ways we can look at it. But it's very important that if your, your spine values look really good, but your hips are not as good, that you look at these pictures to see. And so that's what uh, just an important point that comes up often in my clinic. A new thing that's very experimental, um, but actually is now in use, I have a few patients who are seen by clinics in New York City that they're using this now as a standard of care. We do have this at UCSD in our research facility. This is called a trabecular bone score, and hopefully this will be more mainstream for use as well. And this helps to get us around the issue of the spine bone density. It actually uses a computerized program. You take somebody that looks the same you can see here they have the same bone mineral density, but they actually look at their trabecu in the bone in the vertebrae. And here you can see with their variograms that they can pick out the arthritis and see that there's actually loose porosity, whereas in the other one of this bone density, they have a higher score. So this is becoming more useful to help us with those spine problems. It is available in a research center at UCSD, but once again, hopefully soon, we'll have this as an availability to help us look at the spines that are problematic. So just something you may hear about in the future. So who should have a bone density scan? This is a very difficult question, and I've been tasked to look at this at UCSD for our quality committee because it's the guidelines are different, and it's really hard. There's been new guidelines, this guideline, so and there's all different societies that disagree. And so definitely, um, I will give you my opinion on this, but I will tell you that there is one criteria that is definite, and the United States Preventative Task Force, the one who really makes the primary care guidelines, recommends a bone density in women age 65 and older. Everyone should have a bone density. Now, men, it is more difficult. There have been mixed studies. Now, let's remember that men are just as much at risk for fractures as women, and men really do have fractures in their 80s, and the incidence is very high. So I do agree with the National Osteoporosis Foundation's guidelines and some other guidelines that men age 70 and older should have a bone density scan. Um, and I do get these in my primary patients. I see a lot of male osteoporosis, and it's very important that we identify. Just as women, as they turn 50, their estrogen goes down. Men, too, as they age, testosterone declines, hormones decline at an older age. So 70 seems to be an ideal time that men should be screened. Obviously, with a fracture, anybody should be screened a first fracture um, after age 50. And then if there's a risk factor, um, you can start screening at an earlier age. The re and, and risk factors we'll talk about in a bit. I mean, the reason we're, sc we're not screening as early, we did used to send everyone in their 50s. Some people might remember going a lot more often in the past. And we did that, but now we're treating a lot later and a lot different, which I'll explain later. So I really think 65, unless a risk factor, 65 is the starting age for females and men age 70. So this comes up, this question in my clinic, how often should I have a bone density scan? And there's not an easy answer for this as either. So first of all, it is very important to have your bone density scan on the same machine and the brand, and preferably at the same location. So for instance, at UCSD, if you've done it at La Jolla, you should continue in La Jolla, not go to the Hillcrest in the La Jolla, because they, they do a lot of quality testing, controls. So it's important to have it on the, at the same location so we can compare. Um, there have been some studies that say, well, maybe comparison isn't good um, and different data, but I think it is important that if you are at a clinic to have it at the same place. Now, Medicare has changed their guidelines, and they allow us to get a bone density every two years. Um, now, sometimes we can get one sooner. If you've started treatment, there are variabilities to that, but if you're doing okay, every two years. Now, recent studies have said if you it are in your 50s, and are, I'm sorry, in your early 60s, and even if you've had one earlier and you have that low bone mass, osteopenia, perhaps waiting five years is just okay as well. Um, and even 10 years, some studies say. So 
Um, it is very variable and individual, so I suggest you discuss with your physician about how often. Um, and you can see here they've done a, that recent study. That's what I'm saying, that if you're 50 to 64 without even osteoporosis, you don't need a screen if you got it younger until you're 65 again. So that's showing there was a study on that. Now, there is something else. We do not do this regularly at UCSD, but some of you at other uh, institutions may get a lateral x-ray along with your bone density screen. And that's called a vertebral fracture assessment. So some societies say that if patients have lost greater than, height, height loss greater than an inch and a half, that we should make sure that there are none of those spine compression fractures. So when I see someone in the clinic, so I don't, you know, these are the guidelines of one society, I don't screen everyone, but anyone that comes to my clinic that has had height loss greater than an inch and a half will get a spine x-ray to make sure they don't have a fracture. Also anyone that's on steroids, which is a risk factor greater than three months. So I think this is the biggest one. Now what else can cause height loss? Once again, that arthritis, that osteoarthritis. You can lose height from the disc space narrowing and that. So there are many reasons. People always get worried about the curvature. Having a lot of compression fractures of the spine can cause it, but arthritis can cause it too, which is something that is of aging and that we really can't prevent or treat So at this time. So it's important, though, if you have lost height to get an x-ray of the spine or ask your doctor for a spine, low spine. It's called a lumbar or thoracic and thoracic x-ray. So what are so the other thing when patients come into my clinic, um, I want to know well why do you have osteoporosis, especially in the younger age group? I don't want to just say here's your treatment, goodbye. I want to know is there a reason that I can fix? So maybe you don't need the medications and we can turn this around, or is there something and is there something underlying? So obviously, woo, there's a lot of causes that we need to think about. Um, so I just put that up to tell you there is just a lot. But I ask, when I'm doing my history in the exam room, I'm asking a lot of questions of my patients. And I try to figure out if there's any reason. So there are many causes. And I'll just run through some of the things that you can think about. So um, in men and in women, having an early menopause, so in women age less than 45, um, if you've had an early menopause and did not go on hormone therapy, that is a risk factor. Now, most people now, if you've had a hysterectomy and an early menopause, we do treat with hormone therapy until age 50. But if you've had an early menopause, that's a risk factor. And then in men, we check for testosterone because obviously low testosterone is a risk factor for reduced bone mineral density and osteoporosis. Thyroid, actually hyperthyroid. Um, the fast thyroid, not slow hypothyroid, um, that can actually cause bone loss when somebody is in a hyper state. So we make sure when the TSH is very low, we want to make sure um, that people are on the correct dose of their thyroid medication. A big cause is something called primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, and that is a calcium and parathyroid hormone disorder. Your doctor easily can check for that. There's calcium in the lab work that is done on routine exams, so they can see if your calcium is high, and that would be a clue to this. So it's very easy to pick up, but basically it's one of your glands, and um, it's secreting extra hormone that can be deleterious to your bone and cause bone loss. Vitamin D deficiency, we all know, is a big one. I'm sure everyone, hopefully in this room, has had that checked. We had a mass checking since 2008. Um, and even mine, when I got mine checked, it was 24. It wasn't in the insufficiency. So, But we have to make sure, though, because if it is truly less than 20, um, it is a risk factor, and we need to make sure that that is checked. Um, 20 to 30, and we'll talk about vitamin D a little more lately, is considered an insufficiency. And the goal when we do therapy is really above 30 is the main goal, and we can talk about that when we talk about vitamin D. Um, Cushing syndrome or releasing too much cortisol. So stress hormone, we're all stressed now. We're on our phones, we're running around, we're sec probably secreting a lot extra, but that doesn't necessarily cause bone loss. But there is a syndrome called Cushing's where you secrete too much cortisol and um, there are physical features associated with that that a doctor would pick up on and that causes it. And diabetes has been associated with bone loss and fractures. So it's very important if you do have diabetes to make sure you're getting your bone density screens and talking to your physician. Um, hypercalciuria um, is a cause that is where you're releasing too much calcium into your urine and that usually produces a kidney stone. There might be a sign of that, um, but there are things that we check. 
big thing that I see actually in a younger age and older age, anyone that's had bariatric surgery is at a very risk. There's been lots of studies that show the big, large amounts of weight loss can cause bone loss and also all the nutrients because of the having the surgery you need to make sure that these patients are on vitamin d and getting repleted with the proper amounts of calcium and other minerals malabsorption so bowel disease um, crohn's ulcerative colitis celiac disease these are all important things that i look for and talk to my patients about to make sure they don't have hematologic disorders bone marrow lymphomas cancers can be associated with bone loss medications which i'll talk about transplant patients they're on a lot of medication kidney transplants liver transplants so i look at those patients very closely and assess their bone mineral density alcohol directly toxic to the bone um, more than three glasses a day medium-sized is considered a risk factor for bone loss. One to two a day, they still say it may have a positive effect, but once you get over the three glasses, there's a deleterious effect on bone. Tobacco use, very harmful um, to the bone. Pregnancy, lactation for long periods of time can cause bone loss, and kidney and liver disease states can cause bone loss. So what are some medications? So I always do a very thorough review of the med list of the patients that come in. So make sure that you talk to your physicians, you know, to make sure you're not on any medications that may be harming you or cause bone loss. So steroids are a big one, and that's long-term. So it's not the steroids that you get for a bout of asthma. It's not anything that you take for five or 10 days for anything else. This is three months worth of steroids. Um, so that's important. So short courses are okay. Steroid injections, patients ask. We don't know at this time. Now inhaled steroids for asthma or COPD, there have been association studies, but obviously the um, benefits do outweigh the risks. Um, heparin and Coumadin long-term, there have been associations. Anticonvulsants, there's been some new literature on gabapentin. Um, which is a medicine that we use for pain that there may be some associated risk with fracture. Um, there's a medicine we used to use a lot for seizures, phenytoin or dilantin. These medicines rev up the metabolism of vitamin D and can lead to vitamin D deficiencies. Chronic pain meds are very important. These do can be directly toxic to the bones and cause bone loss. Um, proton pump inhibitors we'll talk about on the next slide. Lithium. Uh, a medication has been associated. The big ones that we're now seeing in a lot of our clinics are aromatase inhibitors. These are um, medicines that people are now on for breast cancer. So there's been many studies that we now, we used to use tamoxifen, and this is a whole other talk in itself, but these medicines that women are now on after certain types of breast cancer for five years and then out to 10 years now, even we're going longer, um, def suppress all the body estrogen and definitely lead to fracture. There's the many studies that show f that they've increased fracture risk and there are fractures associated. So we do watch women on these medicines very closely. Um, and in men, similarly, prostate cancer, um, the there's a special type of therapy, androgen deprivation therapy that some men may need and that too is associated with osteoporosis bone loss fracture. Um, Excess thyroid medication, as we said. There have been some associations with um, SSRIs, which is Zoloft, Prozac, Celexa, but that's been more associated in very high age with fall risk and things like that. Um, and then there is something that we used to use for diabetes that we don't use anymore, TZDs, that is associated with hip fracture. So um, a common question I get asked is about the proton pump inhibitors. So this, the names you might hear is omeprazole and Nexium and all those names, Asifex. So these, there was a study in 2006 that showed some association between hip fractures and chronic use. And then, and this is due to decreased, it decreases your calcium absorption. Um, and then they thought, oh, well, it's associated with hip fractures in tobacco users. So what I do in my clinic and what I encourage all of you to do is that definitely if you need these medicines, stay on them, take your calcium, you know, if you have conditions, but sometimes people don't, and we used to kind of just leave people on it. So I find a lot that I can take people off or say, maybe use it every other day, see how much you need it. There's other types of medicines out there called H2 blockers, Pepsid, Zantac. 
see if that works. I mean, if you need it, you need it. But we do try to say, just because of this implicative data, if you don't need it, maybe try um, something else. So that is out there as a potential uh, effect. So what do I do in my clinic in terms of, so I look through the history, I'm asking all these questions um, to try to find and tease out these issues. And then there's some laboratory tests. Now this has become more controversial too. I always get, I mean, if you're, you usually get in your yearly physical a metabolic panel, which will tease out a lot of these um, issues with the calcium, liver tests, the CBC, any kind of cancers, different things. So your routine blood tests that you're getting really should suffice to figure out some of these underlying causes. If I'm worried and somebody's lost a lot of bone or they've had fractures, then I proceed with further workup. So just so you know, not everyone needs all these tests, but phosphorus and magnesium um, underlying disorders are rare, but every once in a while we can pick those up, um, and I have, so I do check those. Vitamin D, of course, we want to make sure that's sufficient. And the 24-hour urine for calcium and creatinine, I make sure that you don't have too much, you're not spilling out too much calcium into your urine, that hypercalciuria. Um, this is a test for, there's something called multiple myeloma, which is a type of cancer that leads to fracture. So if someone has a fracture, I'm not sure, I may order that. In males, I do order testosterone um, and the thyroid test. And then parathyroid hormone, if the calcium is elevated, I may order that. And then this, this TGG IgA is a test for celiac in a select population. Um, this test I leave on there. Uh, the dexamethasone, that's to rule out any uh, excess cortisol syndromes, but I don't do that frequently because that's something you can pick up on the physical exam. So basically, these are some things that I do look at. Sometimes I order different things, bone markers, but this is a general comprehensive lab to make sure I don't miss anything that I can treat in the clinic. So um, this is just a case. We work really closely at UCSD with our orthopedics team under um, Dr. Steven Garfin, we've really, um, who's chief of our orthopedics. We've really set up a nice fracture program. We have uh, two endocrinologists working embedded in the orthopedics clinic. I'm up in the uh, La Jolla clinic, and my colleague, Dr. McCallan, is down in Hillcrest. And this is a case I presented with one of our surgeons, Dr. Lee. But it was just a nice case showing that um, he had picked up someone who had all these fractures. We went through and ordered labs. And it ended up, we found out that she had cirrhosis of her liver. And so we saved her life, actually, because if he hadn't referred in the past, you know, fracture goodbye, but he referred to the clinic. She got treatment and actually she's she became my primary care patient. So she's doing just great. But if we hadn't he, if he hadn't referred, we may have missed some other underlying causes. And that's happened a couple times to me in the clinic too. The orthopedic surgeons have referred the fracture patients and I've picked up certain kinds of cancers, something called mastocytosis. I pick up primary hyperparathyroid. So I pick up a lot of underlying disease states. So I think it's really important that we're thinking about a fracture and wondering what, what is going on, why is someone having it. So the, then the question comes when we do this and we do the bone density scan, who do we treat? How do we decide these days who needs treatment? So if anyone remembers, so in 2008, we kind of changed our thinking of this. If anyone remembers, before 2008, we took your T-score and we said, your T-score is minus two, or you're in menopause, everyone go on Fosamax today. Does everyone remember that? We did that. <laughs> and we left you on it for years, right? Yes. So that's what we used to do. And then in 2008, we started to think about risk factors. Who do we treat? How do we treat? So we don't just take a blank number anymore and just put you on the medicine. We really think about it and think about you and assess. So obviously, though, if you do have osteoporosis and you're high risk, we should treat. But we really have to think about this low bone mass category, that T-score of minus 1 to minus 2.5. Do we treat? What do we do? And so as you can see here, depending on bone mineral density scores, the fracture rate goes up, see in the orange, as you have osteoporosis, but the number of fractures is high in the osteopenia. And some of that might be kind of what I explained to you before in the spine, even though it looks osteopenia, it might truly be lower and people are fracturing. But this is important that this group, we try to figure out, should we treat you in that osteopenia or low bone mass group? 
So we know about some major risk factors, right? Age is an enormous risk factor. That is the risk factor for osteoporosis. So as your age goes up, you can see here, even at the same T-score, a minus 2.5, at 70, you're much higher risk to fracture, 24% fracture risk, versus at age 50, uh, T-score minus 2.5, you have a 12% 10-year risk of fracture. So age is very important. Also, a prior fracture, as we discussed earlier, increases your risk for future fracture. So at age 60, a T-score of minus 1.8 and having a fracture is a much higher risk than a T-score of the same at the same age, but no prior fracture. So once again, we know that prior fracture is important. So that brings me to the fracs. So anyone that is in this osteopenic range should have this frac score calculated by either your primary physician or whoever you're seeing. And also now our radiologists do this for us. And it's fantastic because on your printout, if you're a UCSD patient, and I know at Scripps, Kaiser, and Sharp, they do this too, and any other systems, it is already there for you. So you can see your risk for fracture. And remember, this is if you have osteopenia. If you have osteoporosis, your risk is already high. So this is something that we fill out. And um, I still use a slide that I made a long time ago, but this is just to show you, we, if somebody is 70, and their T-score is minus two and they have no risk fractures, they actually might not need treatment. So in the past, we always treated these patients, but now we know that there's a lot of factors. So we know that weight is a factor. Having low weight, less than 126 pounds is a risk factor for osteoporosis. Prior fracture. Parent fracturing their hip is huge. I always ask patients about that. So any family history of your parent um, is a risk factor. Smoking, currently, not past, current. Steroids, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and alcohol, as we discussed before. Now this score, if you plan on doing it on your own and assessing your risk online with your scores, just note we don't use the spine for all the reasons that I've mentioned before. So it can only be your hip score that you put in there. So you can't use your spine. Um, and that's because the hip, as I discussed, is a more accurate measure. So this gives you your, and then you punch in the button and you get your 10-year risk of, of uh, fracture. So what does that score mean? If your 10-year risk, if, so if you have osteopenia or minus 1 to minus 2.5, your 10-year risk of hip fracture, if it's greater than 3%, the number that you get, then treatment is likely indicated. And if your 10-year risk is greater than 20% for any fracture, then treatment might be indicated. So this is just a guide. Um, and you know we use this as a guide to say whether or not treatment is indicated. So this really looks um, gives you a good idea of what we're doing here. So here we were in 1999 to 2008, and we just treated everyone with these scores. But look at what we missed. We missed these high-risk patients above 25% that were in their 80s. And we treated all these young patients who might have had even osteoporosis but don't need treatment. So now we're getting people that are more in their 70s and 80s and we're treating them and anyone in the lower ages that might need treatment. So you can see that we're doing a better job by using this FRAC score of capturing the right population to prevent fracture further fracture. So it's only indica indicated, you can only use the scoring system for someone age 50 and older. And, and technically, you're supposed to use it only if you have not been on treatment for a while, um, because it can falsely change results. And remember to use the hip or femoral neck T-score. And remember, it is only a guideline. So clinical decision making is still important. So what do we do um, to prevent osteoporosis, what are some of the things that we can do? So there's a lot, and I will go through it, and we can talk about what you can do to help prevent it. So calcium. So these are the current recommendations. Um, 1,200 milligrams daily for women older than 50, 1,000 for men older than 50, and 1,200 for men over 70. And the goal now is we try to obtain our calcium from food sources if we can. So that's changed a lot. I bet a lot of people here were put on the 1,500 milligrams a day, told to take it three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and for many years. So now we've changed this. We say try and get it through food um, if you can, because what we realized is 
perhaps there's an association with all this calcium. So some people were taking a lot of calcium plus dietary calcium, and perhaps there was a risk of that depositing into the heart and causing coronary artery disease. That being said, there's been a lot of conflicting data since that time saying, no, I think that we're actually okay and this may not be. But for that reason, we are taking a step back and saying 1,200 max, get through the diet, and then um, through food and then supplement if needed. So this is something I can give everyone at the end. This is on the National Osteoporosis Foundation website, www.nof.org. This is a great website. There's so much information. So I encourage you to look at this website um, and this is on there and I'll, I have a handout. But this is something that I encourage my patients to go home and do. Um, you know, and just make sure they're getting enough. So for instance, if you look at a container of milk, you can see that it's 30% in an in eight ounce cup. So that equals 300 milligrams if you drink that whole cup. Almond milk, there are also fortified foods that are great sources of calcium, almond milk, breads, lots of different things that you can do, orange juice. So almond milk, for instance, has a very high quantity of calcium, 500 milligrams. Um, and then you automatically get a 250 a day. So I always tell my patients, if you're drinking one glass of milk at 300 and you add 250, you already have one calcium supplement, 500 milligrams. And then if you get other food sources, cheese, yogurt, some greens, um, you're probably getting your 1200. So there are a lot of people I know who avoid dairy. And so in that case, you should supplement um, if needed. And it's OK. So some people might have a little bit of um, food sources and need one supplement. But I think now we've moved away from the two supplements. And most people just, if they're having a healthy diet filled with calcium-rich food, either need none or just one supplement a day. So that's where we are. So what type? Patients often ask me this. What type of calcium? I go to the food store at CVS. There's millions. What do I do? Costco? I don't know. So actually, the goal, the thing is, we really don't know. There's no type that is better than the other, but there's some tricks. So calcium carbonate needs to be taken with food for best absorption. So calcium carbonate is something that's in Tums, or you really have to look at your label and see what you're taking. Calcium citrate does not need to be taken with food and can be taken in any type of environment. And so we do like that if you are on that proton pump inhibitor, we do prefer the calcium citrate. That can be taken at any time of day. Um, but does one work better than the other? No, as long as you take it the right way. And then, as you know, it can come in gummy form and in chocolate form and in tablets and powder now and all kinds of things. And that's fine. Whatever you like is great, um, as long as you're getting it, we say. So there's all different types. As I said, these are the main types. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of my patients like there's bone up and all different kinds online. But really, just make sure you're not going overboard and make sure um, you're taking the right type. So. Another thing that comes up commonly in my office is patients come in, I say, please bring your bottles of calcium. And sometimes they come in and you can see here, it's so tricky. So look at this one, two tabs equals 400 milligrams, but this one, one tab equals 600. Even today, I had someone come in that was taking 10 tabs just to equal 600 IUs of vitamin D. And she hadn't read the label, and she was vitamin D deficient. So I don't think she realized it. So I think you have to look at your labels really closely. Bring them into your physician if you have any questions. But I find this all the time that people are not taking the right doses or sometimes too much. So please look at that. And it's very different. Everything, every type of calcium is different. So that, it is very tricky. So please look at your labels. So vitamin D, another important building block to uh, bones and prevention. And I do want to say before I move forward with calcium and vitamin D that there have been some studies in the last few years that have been very conflicting, right? Some say you need this. Some say that they don't reduce fracture. So my take on everything, um, while there have been a lot of observational studies that show that there's been some studies that show, remember, calcium and vitamin D have never um, been shown to, they're not a treatment. They haven't shown to uh, reduce the risk of fracture. Um, but they have been shown in some studies to increase bone mineral density, although there have been some studies recently that say maybe, maybe not. That being said, I do think if we're on a low calcium diet, we're going to be at risk and we're going to probably realize 10 years from now that we probably should be at least taking the minimum. So that's why get it in your diet. And then vitamin D, um, I do think is important. You do need a supplement 
um, to get to the right level, which I'll discuss. Now, sunlight um, obviously is a good source, but then our dermatologists do not like us. But, and even in San Diego, there's been studies that we are deficient despite sun, but we wear a lot of sunscreen here, right? Yes, so that does inhibit the rays from being absorbed. So I always say to people, measure your vitamin D. You don't necessarily need it. I have people that do just fine. Um, so really, the rec I follow the guidelines. I know there's a lot of people out there that thought, you know, we thought a lot. We thought, oh, wow, when it first started, it's going to cure breast cancer and cure heart disease, and this is going to be our end all. And I hope it is, but right now we don't know. And so I'm also cautious because when I go to my endocrine meetings, there are some studies that show, well, is too much a problem? There were those studies that showed that perhaps too much vitamin D in older patients led to fractures. So there's been some, some things. So I'm always one to go the moderate road. And that is, I recommend about 800 to 1,000. That's our recommendations. Um, and then max dose that's truly recommended is 4,000. Now, there may be some people who need more, malabsorption, different things, celiac, you know, this is within the range. Um, so what level do I attain? Well, I just like my patients to get over 30 to 32. And this whole thing about treating to a level of 50, this, we don't know. I can't tell you today that there's one level. The real studies were done, showed that less than 20 was actually when fractures occurred, and this 20 to 30 is insufficiency. I bet most people out here, the average person, when I was first checking in 2008, most people were in their 20s to 30s range, and you know, who, we don't know, but we do know that as you approach your 30s, it reduces this level of parathyroid hormone. So we think that 30 is somewhere where you should be above that. So um, that's what I aim for, and that's what I like to see in my patients. And so I do think it's important that anyone that has osteopenia or osteoporosis get a vitamin D test and make sure, because we do know if you are low, it improves bone density. And while it never was shown to prevent fracture, it is still a building block to bone density. Exercise. Very, very important part of prevention. So we recommend about 30 minutes of weight-bearing exercise, five to seven days weekly, and try to do the exercise that you can do. So low impact, walking, elliptical is actually a weight-bearing exercise, uh, low impact aerobics, Tai Chi for balance and being on your feet. Those are great. I tell my patients, get out there and walk. That is great. Obviously, the high impact too, doing different things. Um, so there's, and then there's been studies on this. So there were a lot of studies that show that there is maintenance or improvement on bone density. Although recently, some studies have shown out that they're not sure whether or not um, truly doing all this weight-bearing exercise helps. So hopefully, we will have more um, data out there. But we do know that people that are immobile or not moving do lose bone density. So obviously there's something to getting out there, walking, moving, that is great. So I just, I love it. Most of my patients walk or do something like that and it's great. Bikers, swimmers, and I'm gonna add because we're in San Diego, surfers. Surfers, wow, I do see a lot of those male surfers that are not doing anything but surfing. And so bikers, they're not walking in between. So if you are a biker, please get out there and walk a little bit. Swimmers, walk, you need to be on your feet for a little bit because we do see some osteoporosis associated with these activities. Those are not weight-bearing activities. Um, muscle strengthening exercises, I get a lot of questions about that. What does that mean? Why do we have to do the weights and you know walk? So muscle is important, and I'm going to address that later. We're actually doing a study at UCSD looking at this. It's called sarcopenia, where as you age, your muscle mass around the bone actually declines. So we want to kind of keep our muscles strong. When you fall, you want to have padding around your bone. It helps with the networks. So muscles are very important. Do as little, you know, little nice weights resistance training at Target. Buy some light weights. Do the best that you can um, or gym. So these are good to keep your muscles alive and healthy. Now, physical therapy can be very important. Another thing that I assess is balance, right? Falls. Why do fractures happen? 75% of all fractures happen because of falls. We want to prevent that. So physical therapy can be very helpful. I send a lot of people, there's a woman, a physical therapist at UCSD, Lauren Hermes, who specializes in physical therapy and for osteoporosis and bone disease. So we have someone that does a lot of training with patients here. Um, orthotics, um, and they can devel develop treatment plans to focus on weight-bearing exercise. So even a visit with a physical therapist, if needed, may be helpful. 
And of course, fall prevention is a huge part. That's what I hear all the time. When we hear fractures in the orthopedic clinic, I tripped over the vacuum cleaner cord. I fell at night out of my bed. I walked to the bathroom and didn't have the light on and sat down and fractures, you know, lighting, mats, rails. So just, it's very important. I hear a lot about tripping and falling. And so fall prevention is a good way um, to prevent fracture. So this question comes up a lot. What about caffeine? So actually, thanks to our very own Dr. Elizabeth Barrett Connor, who I believe many of you know, who did the Rancho Bernardo trials, the big osteoporosis trials here at UCSD early on, showed us that it's actually okay. It's not caffeine that's the culprit. Um, so coffee is okay as long as you're getting your adequate calcium. And tea, there is actually some evidence that, that was reported at um, ASP, one of our bone societies a year ago that black tea may help. Then again, that was in very high quantities, like six, six cups a day. So more to come on that. Um, <laughs> soda, uh, cola, so there was a 2006 tough study that showed that the phosphoric acid, specifically, this is in seltzer water, in the colas um, at three cans, eight ounce cans or greater a day did produce bone loss. So just some evidence, you know, I do have people who come in that tell me they're drinking a liter a day, so maybe you wanna cut back to one. You know, these are just some evidence, but soda is the culprit. It's not caffeine that we know of today. So that's some good news. Um, and then I will end here, I really, always talk about the treatments, but we've become so much more complex in our therapies, and I know you all probably want me to talk about that, and I will, I will come back, but I have decided that it's really a two-part talk. So I'm gonna mention some generalizations, um, just so you understand a little bit about our therapies when you're going to the physician. Um, so most of our therapies, these are your bone cells, and osteoclasts um, break down your bone and osteoblasts build up your bone. And so most of our therapies that we have inhibit the osteoclast. They stop bone breakdown. And that's the bisphosphonates and denosumab prolia, uh, most of our therapies. This one, we now have two therapies. We have teriparatide or Forteo. And um, something just came out recently called a baloparatide. That's a new medicine that also works in a pathway of formation. But we've been using um, teriparatide for a long time now. It's been out over 10 years. It's great, and it is the only therapy that stimulates new bone building and new breakdown. So that is a, a and all the other ones target the the osteoclast. So I actually didn't update this, but there is that one new one. But basically. These are all our therapies that we have. Um, so we have, we don't really use ibandronate anymore or Boniva. We have alendronate, the oral, bisphosphonates, IV. We have something called denosumab or prolia and Forteo, and the new one, um, a baloparatide, um, which I told you. And then there's one that, that was supposed to be coming new, but we are waiting for FDA approval. So, in the interest of time, I would love to come back and talk to you much more in detail about all those treatments, and that talk would probably take about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so today I just wanted to update you on the latest in prevention, but I do want to tell you some neat things we have at UCSD. We do have shared medical appointments for osteoporosis, uh, which I run, where you can come in a group setting. Um, we do have a bone health education group, so if you feel you want to come, um, and talk about this. I'm actually giving the next talk, and I will talk about therapies. Um, it's the first Wednesday of every month, and I have an email list. Um, so if anybody wants, um, I didn't list my email in here, but you can contact me. I run an email list about this bone health group, and we meet, and we have a curriculum throughout the year. So we have our Liz Stimson, who's our wonderful orthopedic nurse practitioner who works with Dr. Garfin's team, she's great. We run the gr group, the bone visits together, and she does a talk on fractures and is really helpful in everything we do with bone here at UCSD. Um, we have Deb Cato, another one of our endocrinologists who comes and talks about treatment, Karen McCowan. We talk about calcium. We talk about vitamin D. We have Diane Schneider who many of you may know, who comes and talks about the latest topics. So throughout the year, it meets once a month, um, and there's information on our osteoporosis website at UCSD. 
And then the other big thing I just wanted to mention, which is a hot topic just to put in your ears, there is a relation with the sarcopenia, the loss, age-related loss of muscle mass, strength, and functionality. And we are running a big clinical trial here at UCSD. Um, as I said, the this is very important as you know, the muscles generate the mechanical stress to keep our bones healthy. So this is a new topic. If you go to any of the websites, they're really talking about that. Um, and it is looking, being looked at now. There is a medicine that we're looking at here called a myostatin inhibitor that actually improves muscle function in people with true sarcopenia. Now, how is sarcopenia diagnosed? It's diagnosed actually through a bone density scan, but you have to do it a certain way. We don't do that now, but I just wanted to put this, because you're going to hear this term. I've been noticing it in the newspapers and different things. It's a, it's becoming a hot medical topic, and especially in osteoporosis. So it is that muscle mass. Um, so we are running a clinical trial here for that to help and hope that improves, um, prevents falls, and helps with other things related to osteoporosis. So any questions? or comments. <laughs> I do apologize. I know many of you may have come for the treatments and to hear all about them, and I'm more than happy to come back, but I think a lot of what we do now is more the prevention aspect and learning and learning the right questions to ask, because I may put someone here on one of those therapies. I may give you a bisphosphonate or denosumab, but if your vitamin D is inadequate and you have some underlying cause, that needs to be identified first. So I think I wanted to explain that to all of you today because we don't just jump to the treatments. And so I think you needed to hear that and I'm more than happy in the future if you ask to come back and do a whole treatment lecture. So thank you for your time. Thanks for the support of the Stein. Um, it's such a great organization and I'm so honored to be able to talk to all of you today. So thank you and I'll take questions. Yes. Women are more likely to have an osteoporotic fracture, and women more commonly have osteoporosis. So we when we start, we go through menopause. At age 50, we lose our estrogen supply, right? So much earlier than men. As men age, many of them still do produce testosterone adequately into their 80s or 90s, and they lose this later than we do. So the only thing that I caution, though, with yoga, because occasionally with yoga and Pilates, I do see people that fracture. So I'm talking about yoga for balance, not crazy twisting moves, but yes, it's excellent for balance training, muscle mass, all of that. And there are studies actually looking at that now as a weight bearing exercise too. So we will find out more info. So the question is, do we still use the term osteopenia? And we're trying to move away from um, the International Society of Bone Densitometry is trying to recommend that because really it was created um, kind of, uh, I think low bone mass is a, it's more of a label and they're trying to create it back that it's a low bone mass. When you say osteopenia, it's really a disease state and, osteo and, and carries weight in it. And it wasn't created, it was created more when the drug companies were trying to define the terms and when to treat. So we are trying to move away from that. And, we know, and also in age less than 50, we're not trying to use the term osteoporosis anyway. So we move away from even both of those terms. When you're less than 50, we, when you have what would have been called osteoporosis, we use the term low bone mass. Is there a relationship between osteoporosis and scoliosis is the question. And the one relationship that there is, is that when you have scoliosis, which you cannot prevent, right? That's curvature of the spine. I mean, you can do exercises and things to help, but the one relationship is that it can increase your risk for fracture because of the curvature. Yes, so that's a good question. The question is, is if you do localized or if you do exercise such as walking, um, does it produce a systemic effect all over your body to increase bone density? And the answer is yes. The weight bearing when you're walking on your body, you're stimulating your osteoblasts, those bone building cells, and telling them to make new bone. So it can have a systemic effect. So the question is, did I mention, I'm saying to take so what does, I want you to take some calcium, 1,200 milligrams daily in your diet is what I recommend, if you can get it through your diet, as we discussed, but too much may be a bad thing, so that's why we're limiting to 1,200. So the question is, why could calcium be bad? Well, there are a couple reasons. Um, one I didn't mention, too much calcium can lead to kidney stones, and it can also, they think it could deposit in your heart and cause heart disease, but then they're not sure, was my answer. There's been conflicting studies. What about balancing with magnesium? So 
the question is, do we need magnesium? The answer is no, unless you're magnesium deficient. There is a lot out there in the health food stores that you actually need magnesium to absorb your calcium, and that is not true. Your own body does that for you. We, there is rare to see a magnesium and phosphorus deficiency. I look for it because it can happen in my world, but not everyone out there needs it. Do we take magnesium for other things, sleep, leg cramps, things? It's fine, but do we need it for osteoporosis? No. Great question. So as you probably read this week, they are making even more. So the United States Task Prevention Force is trying to create cutoffs. So the question is, you know, for colon cancer screening, do we need to do a colonoscopy when you're 80? Do we need to do a mammogram when you're 100? You know, that's the kind of thing. But what happens with bone density? We do. We always need to think about it because when do the fractures happen? 80 and up. Fractures are more likely to happen when you're in your 80s. So we are thinking about it until you are 102. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, the question is, can we address young um, young people and get their bones addressed. So actually one of my colleagues is doing a great job of that. So Dr. Diane Schneider, um, she has a website for, as in number four, bonehealth.org. Four is in the number four, bonehealth.org. And she is local in San Diego. She's retired here and she's doing an excellent job. She's created programs with high school students. And so if you're interested, contact her because her emails are or contact me and I can get in touch with her because she would she loves to do this and this is what she wants to do is running probably better weight bearing exercise than walking yes but is walking adequate yes so it's hard to say and studies haven't really shown one than the other we also have an issue in that our ultra athletes and long distance so we know that people who over exercise actually lose bone density and have a lot of fractures right and um, especially in females and the female athlete triad and things like that. So I think that the, while, when I say, oh, well, walking is good, we know that that is a healthy exercise that builds back bones. Is, could running do better? Could you do better? Sure. Do we have the adequate studies to say that? They're mixed is probably the answer. So we don't have the best answers. So that's why I do recommend um, trying to walk, especially for my patient population. I think walking is, is a great exercise if you can. Um, it's one of the easier ones to do. So And faster walking is probably a faster pace we do know is probably a little bit better for creating the bone density. But once again, the studies are mixed whether it truly is improving bone density and preventing fractures. There's a lot of mixed literature out there astronauts that are up in the air for a year they lose bone density that's why we know that people who are immobile and that can't move they lose bone density that being said this whole exercise those people that are out there five miles a day may not be better off than someone work, walking 30 minutes a day so it's all in gradation so the point is to get out and move we're not still clear on how much but it doesn't hurt we do know 30 minutes a day you know running may be better than walking but if you walking is good so that's what I'm trying to say that it all helps. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here today, everyone.